Hi, I'm Andy from Haltech and we're here at PRI 2019. Haltech comes to PRI because that's where all the main players are in our racing industry. So anytime you want to network with people or work out ways we can work together, that's where you do it. But also you get a chance to connect, connect with customers and also show your latest products. And what we're really excited about is our brand new product which is the Nexus R5 ECU PDM combination thing. In terms of understanding what the thing actually is, the easiest way to explain it is it's an ECU with a PDM built in. What we're trying to get away from is the fact that when you have a race car, you've got an ECU and you've got a PDM and you've got other boxes with extra I.O. and wideband controllers and that sort of thing. So that means that whenever you do that, you've got to mount all these things, you've got to wire them all together and configure them all. And we decided that if you put them all together in one box, then it's easy to configure. When one box doesn't do the right thing, you've only got one software package that you can connect to it with instead of having to use multiple software things to work out where the problem is. And it's also easier to wire, easier to mount, easier to diagnose. Everyone's happy. The original design for the Nexus R5 was actually a little bit before my time at Haltech. So I started at Haltech about 18 months ago. And when I started there, they already had the idea for this is what we're going to build. And I'm pretty sure it came from the concept of what they generally see on pro mod cars because of the amount of I.O. they need. And especially when you've got a stage injection eight cylinder, where you've got the 2500 and a race expansion module as well to get enough I.O. on it. They said, let's put it all together. That was about 18 months ago when it was at that point that we started developing it after then. The original design brief was that it was going to have a certain number of outputs to drive certain things and that's what was needed for the pro mod cars that we do. So it was originally decided we we're going to have four of these 25 amp outputs so you can drive things like thermo fans, fuel pumps and things like that directly from the ECU rather than having to have separate relays that you have to wire in and 12 8 amp outputs as well to drive other things that need power, so your boost control solenoids and you know, other devices like that. In terms of what was actually difficult about it, what was difficult was that Haltech had never really designed a PDM before. So it was a completely new sort of technology for us. We could have designed it as a standalone PDM first, or we could have done this. We thought that this way would actually give us a better way to service our customers, rather than having a separate box which then people still have to wire in and mount separately and that sort of thing. So we did a lot of testing on PDM circuits with things that people needed to do, like positive modulating thermo fans to drive them at different speeds. Um, same with fuel pumps, because you know if you run fuel pumps and you've got say three fuel pumps and they're running flat out, you get a lot of heating in the fuel, so you need to be able to drive them slowly. There was a fair bit of work involved in the circuit design for that, and then actually getting it all together into a box that size, because it is actually quite small for what it does. We've actually got three circuit boards stacked together to get everything in the size. That was probably the hardest part, was getting everything down to that size. The reason why we went with the Pro Mod first of all is because we knew that that's the, the superset of everything else that's required. Once we know it works with that, then we can either, we can bring out a cut down model if we have to for smaller ones. But with Pro Mods, a lot of them just run mechanical fuel pumps, for example. So they don't need the outputs for fuel pumps, but they do need the outputs for other things like some trans brakes draw 20 amps, for example. So you can't just run that off a 10 amp output. Make it work with the Pro Mod meant that we knew that it would be able to work with other things as well. So yeah, that's the motivation behind that. Where it's really well suited to is where you have a, a completely gutted car that needs whole new wiring and that way you can wire up fans and fuel pumps and all that sort of thing from scratch. Because if you had to do that with an existing system, you'd either be mounting relays and fuse boxes or multiple separate PDMs. It could also work well on a street car where you still have all the um, turn signals and headlights and all that sort of thing. And you don't want to do all those from a PDM, but you want the ECU to be able to have enough engine control stuff in it to drive things like fans and pumps and things like that. Really, there's two sort of separate markets for it. In terms of a normal street car, if, you, if the power distribution in the street car is already enough for you and you don't have problems because you're running big ignition coils that draw more current than the factory wiring was, was made for, then you'll be all right with the factory wiring and you'll be okay with just normal plug and play, you know, platinum um, ECU for that. In terms of other um, opportunities for the ECU, the fact that it does things like dual drive by wire means that we can attack other markets that we hadn't before, like say R35s for example. And with more I.O. it means that we can do other cars that just need a lot of I.O., like a lot of modern cars. You know, you've got quad VVT, you've got multiple inputs for dash switches and all that sort of thing. So it'll give us a good platform for doing lots of modern cars as well. Having a PDM and the ECU together means that you can drive any outputs on the PDM just as though they were ECU outputs. So things like when you have a thermofan output, you can 
configure that as a duty cycle output from an elite ECU and you can say, I want this DPO to switch at this speed, but you can't drive a thermo fan from a DPO output from the ECU. So you need a separate solid state relay or something like that to drive the thermo fan. Whereas this way, instead of doing that, you just select, I want to use 25 amp output number one instead of DPO number one, and then you connect that to your thermo fan, job done. You don't need to configure a PDM as well. That's one benefit. Obviously with this sort of device, because there's so many pins on it, you get so much more I.O. anyway. But the other benefit is that we found that a lot of people that buy the 2500 Elite ECUs, they buy it with the premium harness, which has got the fuse relay box thing as part of the deal. So a lot of those installations will be going onto cars which already have wiring in the car. But people obviously want that so that they can either bypass the wiring or maybe the factory wiring doesn't give enough current for them. Say, you know, when you put an upgraded fuel pump on, you know, the factory wiring is not strong enough for you know, just even a bigger fuel pump, let alone multiple fuel pumps. I think there'll be a lot of benefit to those sort of installations as well. On most PDMs, you'll see there's a screw terminal with a thing that goes on it, which is the positive power. And the reason why you need that is that when you add up all the current that all those outputs can drive, when you're driving multiple fuel pumps and fans and, and all your ignition coils and all your injectors and that sort of thing, it adds up to a lot of current very quickly. When we've got 425 amp outputs and 12 8 amp outputs, in total that's about 200 amps. So you really need a two gauge cable with a big ring terminal on to get all the current through. We decided to use these um, shore lock connectors instead. So instead of a ring terminal, we use these. And there's a, a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that there's no torque on them. You can actually rotate them, which means that instead of having a ring terminal and putting a nut on it, having too many agar duggers on it and then you know just throwing the, um, the stud, that's one thing we want to avoid. Um, the other thing is the fact they're flexible means you don't have preload in the, in the loom where you've got the cable on it. It means you can remove it without any tools. You know, it's waterproof when it's assembled. They look nice, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it. So that's the reason why the red one's there. The reason why the black one's there is because those 25 amp outputs can actually drive high and low. If you've got four of those that can sync 25 amps each, that's 100 amps straight away. And also you've got 18 injector outputs, 12 ignition outputs and eight DPOs and when you add up all those currents, that adds up to a lot as well. We needed some that's about the same size and we said, okay, we'll just put another 200 amp black terminal on there. So that's why they're there. We didn't intend to make it look like a battery, but you know, that's kind of, I guess, what's happened. The other thing is, of course, the Wi-Fi antenna. Things we wanted to was, was have wireless connection on it because sometimes ECs are mounted in difficult locations. And also, when a car comes into the garage or something like that, and other people have got to work on the car mechanically, it's convenient to be able to connect to it from your laptop and get data from it when you're away from the car. Actually, our general manager of the US office, because he's into drag racing, he said that he wants to be able to get back into the garage, take his helmet off, get out of the car, and go back to the laptop. By the time he's got back to the laptop, he wants to see a data log of his run on the laptop already. And we can do that now, because the laptop can automatically sync with the ECU. It automatically reads the logs out if it sees any new logs that it doesn't have yet. So they're there, so that's the reason for that. The ECU component of the R5 is based on the Elite ECU, so all the functions that you've got in the Elite ECUs that you're used to will work the same on this. So and also means you can import maps from the Elite into this and all that sort of thing, so that's nice. The reason why we needed um, to do something different from the Elite ECUs is that we wanted a lot more I.O. for a start. So the 2500 is limited with eight injector outputs. So if you want to run 16 injector outputs or 18 injector outputs, then you need to have other boxes there to do it. And that's inconvenient, it's, you've got to set it up. It's just not a very clean solution. So that's one reason we had to sort of step it up and go a bit next level. Um, the other thing is that even with those expansion modules, you don't get any more ignition output, so you can't run a V12 direct fire, which you want to do. So you can do that with the R5. And there are also some internal changes, which probably won't mean much. And, unless you design ECUs for a living, like I do. But things that basically mean that we can do a lot faster data logging and get the data out of the logs a lot faster as well, which is probably for drag racing, it's not such a big deal because the logs are so short, but especially for circuit racing and that sort of thing. One of the requirements that, that came out of our market research was that we wanted a lot more data logging in it. So the elites, I think, have got eight megabytes in them, and this has got 512. When that requirement came out, I, I sort of said to our general manager, well, we're going to have to be able to get the data out a lot faster because people are going to log more data because there's more data storage there, but they're probably going to expect to get out at the same time, so we're going to have to make it faster to be able to do that. So there are a lot of internal changes to be able to speed that up. So we've got a dual core processor, one just runs the engine, one does all the paperwork like the data logging and communications with the Wi-Fi PC and that sort of thing. A lot of internal improvements which probably don't mean a lot to, to other people, but they 
mean that we could get it down to this size and um, we can get faster data logging and comms and that sort of thing. There's been a long-standing um, question of, of whether the data logging should be done in the ECU or the dash and I guess historically a lot of times it's been done in the dash because I guess that's the way a lot of the manufacturers have done it. In this case I really wanted to be able to get it into the ECU because the things that you want to measure and the time domains that you want to measure them in, the ECU's got the information, it's got to send it to the dash over CAN, it's going to be delayed and slow and that sort of thing so if you can actually do all that logging in the ECU instead then you know you're miles ahead. The reason I think where a lot of people want really fast logging is for things like suspension travel so you can do your shock tuning and that sort of thing and so we've got enough inputs on the ECU now there's 23 analog inputs plus another 10 inputs that can be analog inputs if you want them to be so there's enough of those that you can feed your suspension travel sensors directly into the ECU and log them at a really high rate you shouldn't need to log anything from the dash and if there's other stuff that you can't get into the ECU to be able to log then we'll have to get that in over can. It also includes a dual wideband controller and this is actually a brand new technology thing for Haltech because you probably would have seen that we've got, we released a, an LSU 4.9 standalone wideband about a year ago, but we really wanted to be able to support the NTK sensors and that's not a big deal for street cars or time attack cars, but for pro mods that run methanol, you need an NTK sensor because that's what will measure the really rich mixtures and also not fall apart when you know methanol sees them. So we designed a whole new wideband control that does the LSU 4.9 and the NTK. So that's all in the box and we'll probably support other sensors in time as well. Like, I know the circuit will handle the 4.2 but if there's enough demand for it we'll do it but if not then you know, the 4.9 and the NTK should, should do what you need. Whenever you release a product people always come along and say hey, can we do this and this and this so it's, it's an ongoing evolutionary process. There are things that we certainly want to do in, the, uh, in this product that we currently don't do but it's not going to stop it from doing what it needs for the market it's intended for. So there's two parts to that. One of them is, yes, there is space now available to do new functions, and we've got some of those in mind already. But also, some of the new functions that we'll develop will be able to bring to the elites as well. We had to make new software for the R5 ACU, basically because we had to do implement new communications to make it faster. The way that ESP handles the communications and data storage and so on, is not the most efficient and that's why it's slow to start up and to load the framework and that sort of thing. The reason why I went to the new software was for performance. Basically to make it faster for people to get online with the ECU and do what they need to do. In terms of the layout, the way that the Elite ECUs work is they've got a description thing which describes all the settings in the ECU and all the all the channels and how they interact and which which settings you can see when, and which are Ill illegal combinations and it comes them up in red and all that sort of thing. So we're still using that, so you still get all the same error checking and that sort of thing with the new software, but it means it can run faster, which makes your life as a tuner easier. The other thing that we're changing is we're changing the structure a little bit because some of the things in ESP are a bit back and forth, where you need to go to this screen, then that screen, then go back again to get something set up. So this gives us the opportunity to, I guess, to optimise some of those things as well. If you can use an Elite, then you'll be able to use this software as well. Because it's roughly the same structure and we're using the same terms, we're not coming up with a whole new vocabulary to describe things and all that sort of thing. And like I said earlier, the functions work the same way as they work in the Elite. So if you're familiar with the Elite, you'll be able to use this guy. It'll be on sale in March 2020, and I'm very excited to see where it goes and ends up. Yes, we've already got it running in some of the test cars and that sort of thing, and I'm very excited about running it in my daily. It's, it's a lot of fun. And I'm interested to see, actually, what people do with it that we weren't expecting. So I know that Pro Mods are going to use it, but I'm also really interested to see all the other people that we hadn't really thought of yet, to see how they use it and what sort of things they ask for that we haven't thought of yet. I think that'll be really interesting to see.